and start the recording. All right. With that, I do want to welcome you all here and thank you for being present and sharing uh, your interest in uh, looking at uh, Jupiter Hub, Autograder, and Gradescope. Um, I'm Carrie Whipple with the Office of FAS EdTech. Um, see many familiar faces and just want to um, very much thank uh, Dr. Lucas Champion for being here with us today and sharing his wisdom. I also um, do want to say projects like this, um, sharing the brilliance that you are doing in your courses, in faculty and instructors and students you're working with is something that the Office of EdTech is always interested in. Um, and if there's any way we can support, magnify or enhance the work you're doing, um, we'd love to be in touch with you. In the chat, I'm just going to put um, the easy information for finding your FAS um, EdTech liaison or for contacting us. Uh, but with that, without further ado, I do want to introduce um, Dr. Lucas Champion, who has kindly offered um, to share this workshop with us today. Uh, he is in the Department of Linguistics um, here in Arts and Science uh, and was a recipient of a um, 2022 Teaching Innovation Award, uh, of which he is offering this workshop as part of on um, the automated assessment with Jupyter Hub, Autograder, Autograder, and Gradescope. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Lucas. Oh, one thing I will say, um, apologies, is that if you have questions, please feel free to pop those in the chat. Um, we'll be keeping uh, track of those and hopefully answering them um, right in line as we're um, covering the material. Uh, but there will be plenty of time even after uh, the session if you'd like to stay around to have some particular questions answered. Hey. Right. Thank you so much for this gracious introduction, Carrie. And uh, thank you for all the work that you have done to help me set up this workshop. I also would like to thank uh, uh, Lucy and her Office of Educational Technology who has helped me throughout the years, uh, both with the stuff I'll be covering in this workshop and with other things. Um, so I'm, uh, I'd just like to start by asking everyone to drop a few lines in the chat saying um, if you're faculty, postdoc, TA, or otherwise, and um, in where you teach, because I'm curious and I'm also trying to get a sense of the audience. Um, somebody asked if, um, uh, how open are you all to talking to folks who teach outside of arts and science? So definitely very open. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the stuff that I, I talk about should be relevant to anyone who teaches a class with a, um, with a large component that can be graded automatically. So for example, programming heavy classes or uh, classes that have a lot of math. Um, but uh, there's also ways to um, benefit from what I'm presenting today, even if that's not your type of class, so long as you're interested in streamlining grading for large classes. Okay, so um, I see a lot of faculty, a uh, bit of staff, um, PhD students teaching, um, some TAs, uh, several, there are several TAs here who are helping me with the course this summer, uh, which is applying these techniques. Um, I have taught a course called Patterns and Language um, now twice using the setup that I'll be presenting. So I have a little bit of experience with it. And um, what I'd like to start doing is uh, first making sure that everybody on this call has access to the Brightspace site. And if you do, um, then um, I encourage you to open a browser and follow along because this is meant to be a hands-on tutorial. Um, so perhaps Carrie could uh, drop the Brightspace site link into the chat. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. So this is roughly what it should look like to you. So I'd like to start by just giving you an impression of what it looks like from the student, student's point of view to take a course uh, that has this setup. So a student will um, access uh, the course through Brightspace, just like you are doing now. And if you go to the content tab, you'll find a number of materials here. And let me also mention that these materials will stay online 
after this workshop ends and um, and that should provide a hopefully useful resource for any of you who would like to uh, copy some of this stuff into your own courses if you'd like to get set up. So what we're going to do now is um, go to uh, how to access Jupyter Hub. So this is a essentially a copy of a page that I set up for the students in my patterns and language course, uh, which is why this is very detailed. It explains all of the steps that I'm going to go through now uh, that allow students to log on to the website that we are using here at NYU um, to host Jupyter notebooks, which are the kind of format that we'll be using um, to set up our auto graded exams. So the first thing to do is to make sure that you're logged on on uh, Google using your NYU Google account. And what this means is if you have more than one account, you want to make sure that your Google, your NYU account uh, is in the foreground like I just did. Once that's done, um, you will go to the Jupyter Hub website of the course. And um, now for this demo course, I set up two of these sites. Uh, one of them is already set up and the other one is essentially in a blank slate. Now each Jupyter Hub site has two uh, internet addresses. One is for students, one is for instructors. The, the one that you see here is the one for students, which is why we're going to go to this one first. So what you should see then is something like, not quite like this, it will ask you to log in, it will ask you to sign in, and at this stage, you should be able to sign in using your NYU account. Then it'll load up for a while, maybe a minute or so, or so and then it should show this. So now, well, we're waiting for your sites to load. Um, let me say a few words about Jupyter Hub. So Jupyter Hub in the Sorry, did someone say something? Okay. So Jupyter Hub is where we can post Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks are a combination of text and programming languages. They can be based on Python, but also in other programming languages. Now we are focusing on Python. We will also be using a tool called AutoGrader, and AutoGrader is assuming that you use either Python or R. So at this stage, it supports only Python or R as programming languages. Now, the um, um, Jupyter Hub is very versatile and uh, can be used both in connection with AutoGrader, like we're going to be doing here, but also can be used on its own. So even if you decide at the end of this workshop that autograding is not your thing, you may still find Jupyter Hub useful. Now, if you go into the shared folder here, the shared folder has uh, various resources that we're going to be using um, in this course. Among other things, there is a folder called Intro to Python Notebooks. This is what I use for, the for those students in my classes who don't have any background in programming yet. So what we'll do is we'll select this folder and then click on Move. And then we'll remove this and click on Move again. And what this will do is it will attempt to move this folder from the shared folder into our home directory. It will fail to do this because we don't actually, as students, have the right to erase anything from the shared folder. So we cannot move. But what this will do is it will copy instead of moving. And this is what we want. So it has now copied this notebook into our home directory. So the shared directory has the same files for all of us, students. The home directory has only those files which we have copied into. OK, it seems that I have already copied this a uh, while ago into this directory. So now if you open this directory, you'll find two Jupyter Notebooks, part one and part two. Each of them goes over the basics of Python, which I assume you know at this point. Okay. So now you can execute Jupyter Notebooks by clicking into a code cell and running it. And if this is new to you, uh, then uh, you may want to pause the recording. If you're looking at a recording, uh, look things up. I'm assuming that you know about Python. Uh, but do feel free to ask questions in the chat if you're confused. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go back into the home directory and then again into shared. And then we're going to do the same thing I just did for this folder, but this time with the assignment 01 folder. 
So we're going to move this into our own directory. Now, assignment 01 contains another Jupyter notebook, but this time it's one which has been, um, um, which has essentially been um, spiced up a little bit with Autograder, which we'll be talking about. So this is a, an assignment which is as simple as it gets and still demos all the relevant features of Autograder that we'll be covering today. So the first thing to note is this cell here. Any Autograder enabled notebook starts with the cell and you need to tell your students to run the cell before they can do anything else in the notebook. This is also uh, what the instructions here essentially tell you. So now, now once we run this cell, you're ready to go into the questions. And so here I have an example of a manually gradable question, which is a, essentially an essay prompt. Uh, and what, okay, so I just noticed that I've already solved this assignment. So let's just go back, delete this. Complain, so I'm just going to delete it from the text from the terminal. Okay, and then I'm just going to go back and copy it over again from the shared folder. Did I just delete it from the shared folder? I hope not. Uh, I may have. Um, that, that sort of thing was bound to happen here. I'm sorry about that. Let me just see if I can pull it up again from the instructor site. So, okay, so um, give me just a second. This is as good an occasion as any to tell you about the instructor site. So for each Jupyter, book, Jupyter Hub site, there is a student facing part and an instructor facing part. And the instructor facing part has the same link as the student site but with minus instructor entered into it. So this is where we're gonna go. And again, feel free to follow along. You are all uh, instructors as well as students in this course. Oh, and I know, I know actually what went wrong just to say, because I myself am a, never mind. So now we're going to uh, have two options when we start the instructor site, general and turbo mode. Um, Terma mode is appropriate only when you're planning on installing packages, which we're gonna to get to later. Um, at this time, just select general. Turma mode essentially uh, causes NYU to lose a little bit more money than general. So we only use it when we absolutely have to. Okay, so now at this point, while the server is starting up, let me just ask if anyone has trouble following along, if you're trying to follow along, feel free to unmute yourselves. I wasn't be able to move the thing like it gave an error. Okay, so when you try to move the folder, it gives you an error because you cannot move a folder out of a shared folder. So that that error is actually expected. Uh, so even though you got the error, you should be able to go into your home directory and see the shared folder, uh, see the content of the shared folder you just copied over. Okay, so let's see now. So we are in a shared folder. So um, now on the instructor site, I have a shared folder as well. That's the same as the one we've just seen. And I have a group share folder. Now group share is the folder that I'm using to store essentially all of the backstage stuff that the students don't get to see but that I still want to be able to share with the teaching assistants or with any fellow instructors of the course. So in this case, the group share folder um, contains another folder here, which has a randomized string in part of its name. This is so that students can't guess its name. Um, and within this randomized, uh, this folder with a randomized string, the sorted folder as it's called, there's a number of subfolders. And now I don't expect you to follow every single step. What I'm simply going to do now is I'm going to go into the first assignment and I'm going to take the um, student facing part of that assignment and I'm going to
copy it over into the uh, shared folder. Okay, so this is going to be the assignment one file that I just accidentally deleted. I'm going to do this from within the terminal so it's easier for me. Okay, so what I've now just done is I've copied a new version of the assignment that I just apparently accidentally deleted from the backstage part of my Jupyter Hub instructor site into the shared folder, which is therefore now available to students. Okay, um, and yes, Aiden, thanks for pointing this out. There's other ways to, uh, kind of smarter ways to distribute files to students that, uh, that you can exploit that I'm not actually using. Okay, so now let's go back to the student site. I'm gonna close these tabs so I don't get confused. And within the shared folder, there should now be the assignment that I just copied over. Okay, and so now this assignment, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy it from the shared folder into my my own home directory. I'm going to do it via the command line just to be on the safe side. But normally you should be able to do this also via the GUI. Okay. And here we are again. Okay, so this is now what I was intending to show you earlier. My apologies about that. This is a pristine version of the practice assignment as students will see it the first time they access it. So after we initialize Otter, the first question here asks you uh, what's the answer to the ultimate question? Life, the universe, and everything. And as we all know from Douglas uh, Adams, it's 42. So please, yes, correct, Andrew. So uh, if you're following along, please feel free to type in your answer to this question here. This will, this will be on the exam later. So make sure you type in the correct answer, or if you type in a different answer, we'll see this in a few moments when we go into the greater part of the site we'll be using. So now question two is the same kind of prompt, but this question will be auto-graded by um, auto-grader or by grade scope on auto-grader's behalf. Okay, so, so here type in 42, and now part of auto graders services are what's called public tests. This here is an example of a public test. What this does is students get to see a little bit of information about what they have just typed in. So in this case, I chose behind the stage, um, I chose to tell students whether what they have typed in is an integer. So if I type in an integer, it says you have entered, and this is a message that I chose, it's a customized message. You have entered your solution in the correct format. Whether it is the right solution will be checked after you submit. Okay, so now although the correct answer is in fact 42, um, this public test is set up in such a way that it will not tell you that anything is wrong if you enter the wrong number, so long as it is a number. If on the other hand, you type in something that is not even a number, it will tell you that this is completely incorrect. So in general, public tests are a way to allow students to get feedback on whether they are kind of within a certain range of possible answers. Uh, you don't want to use public tests to tell them exactly the answer, because in that case, they could just try a number of things and they, they could game the assignment, essentially just trying too many things at once. Um, okay, so now that we have both questions answered, we're going to check everything. This just makes sure if it's a very long assignment, we haven't forgotten any question. Okay, and now we are ready to submit. Now to submit, what we do is first, we save our work. Um, this, depending on the browser, 
is not entirely absolutely necessary. The browser will attempt to save on your behalf, but it's best practice to tell your students to save anyway in case something goes wrong. And once you saved, you then submit. And to submit, you run this last cell. The last cell creates a zip file that encapsulates all the answers you've given, in this case, to these two questions. Uh, in this case, it also complains that it tried to save on your behalf, but couldn't. This is why I mentioned you should always tell your students to save. And there is a link to zip file. So click on this link and save it. And now we're gonna head over to another site to submit it. So let me know if you have trouble reaching the stage. Okay, so we're gonna go back to Jupyter Hub. And now we think we're gonna hop over to the other site that we're using, which is Gradescope. And still, we're going to access it as students. That is to say, um, ideally, I would like to be able to allow you to access it as students. But there's a technical problem here, which is I'm unable to actually make each of you, both student and instructor, on Gradescope at the same time. So what I am going to do instead is I'm going to log on to Gradescope myself as a student using a non-NYU email address. I'm going to log out first. Just for you to see what it's like if you're a student who is logged into or who, is, who has registered for this course. So what it looks like is this. And as an instructor, I've set this up in advance. So for each Jupyter Notebook that's set up with AutoGrader, there's two assignments on Gradescope. One assignment is for everything that's autograded, in this case, question two. You can submit here and then immediately get feedback within a minute or two on whether you have, um, you, whether your answer was correct. So in this case, I've already submitted previously. I'm gonna resubmit. This is something you as an instructor can allow or disallow. So what I'm doing here is I'm uploading the zip file that I just downloaded from, um, my Jupyter Hub notebook. And now it's being automatically graded. And this is gonna take a moment or two. So what the auto grader is doing is this. First, it evaluates my answer to question two, which was uh, the one that it can grade. Second, it takes my answer to question one, compiles it into a LaTeX document, and submits that document on my behalf to the other part of the grade scope assignment, to the other grade scope assignment, the one that's called uh, manually graded. Okay, now what this means is that as a student, I will get immediate access once this has finished running to the part of the grade that's based on my automatic question. And as for the manually graded question, what will happen is this. First, I can submit, uh, as long as the instructor has allowed it, I can submit as many times as I want. Each time, the uh, answer that I gave will override, overwrite all of the previous answers that I gave. Only the last submission counts. Um, now the, um, okay, thank you. Um, Okay, yes, so um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. So some folks are having trouble with, um, uh, probably with uh, solving the notebook. So what you have to do, you have to make sure that before you solve the notebook, you have copied or moved it from the shared directory into your home directory. And this is something you have to impress on your students. Um, for example, by copying and pasting the instructions that I, I posted on the Brightspace site. If you try to solve the assignment from within the shared folder, it will not let you because the shared folder doesn't contain anything that you can edit as a student, it's read only. Okay, so this is a little bit of a learning curve for students, but eventually they all get it. Okay, meanwhile, we are done waiting for the auto grader results. So what this tells us is that we have received 50 out of 50 points on question two. Okay, this is because we answered it correctly. So as you can see, 
now the student who has solved question two can get feedback, not automatically, but within a few minutes. Okay, so what this means is students, as long as you as the instructor allow them to resubmit, students can go back, change their answer and resubmit. Now, if you prefer for them not to be able to do this, you can limit the number of submissions via grade scope. But I found it useful not to limit it. Okay, now this was question two. Okay, uh, is there ever an issue with load on grade scope with the, when the assignment is due? Somebody's asking this in the chat. I haven't had such an issue. So, uh, for what it's worth, I've taught a class with, um, I think, 100 students or so, uh, and never ran into this kind of issue. Um, okay, so let's go back to our dashboard and the manually graded part of the assignment. So, at this point, there is not much to see except for the LADIC document with the answer to our first question. Um, going back to the grade board, uh, to the dashboard, we can see that the auto graded part shows up with 50 out of 50 points. Um, so that's good. Oh, another question in the chat. Do you penalize for resubmission so they're not just guessing? Um, I don't. I'm not actually sure if there's a way to do this. Um, maybe there's a tricky way to do this, but um, I haven't looked into this. Um, I guess I tend to for formulate my questions in such a way that it is difficult to get to the answer by plain guessing. Okay, all right. So now let's say that we are uh, changing our hats from student hat to TA hat, or whoever does the grading, whether it's you or the TA. So I'm gonna log out from grade scope as a student, and I'm gonna log in to Gradescope as an instructor. I'm gonna go into my course. I'm gonna look at the assignments. And I can see that there's a number of submissions to the assignment. Um, so that means a number of you have been following along. And so I'm now going to go into the manually graded part and grade your submissions. So normally this would be after the due date, so let's just pretend that the due date has expired and I'm going to grade. So maybe, so let's just, let me just ask if you could type into the chat whether you are familiar with grade scope so I can get it a sense. Okay, so, okay. Okay, so this is new to many folks, so that's good. Um, so this is not gonna be too redundant. So what we're going to do at this stage, we're going to go into grade submissions. And then there's only one question to grade. Remember, uh, the other question was auto graded, so we don't get to see it. Now, grade scope is a very powerful tool, even independently of auto grader, so you can use it by itself. One of the things that it allows you to do is group answers, or in case that the answers are very similar, uh, like visually, it can even use OCR to group them for you. So we are exploiting this because um, the solutions that we have gotten are essentially all looking the same because we all said 42. So what this means is even though there's six submissions, there's only two groups and normally there should be only one, but I guess for some reason it didn't notice that these two are the same answer. So what we're gonna do at this point, we're gonna merge these two groups and the point of these groups and of merging them is that once you've grouped a number of answers together, after reviewing them to make sure that they have been grouped correctly, you can then save time or your TA can save time by grading them all at once. So again, this is useful independently of other grader, but uh, we kind of carry over these benefits of grade scope on top of those provided by our grader. Okay, so, now our first answer is, or first group of answers is 42, or rather this is a group. This is an ungrouped answer. So we're going to just put this ungrouped answer, which for some reason the tool was not able to group properly, maybe because of this little blue stuff here. We're going to just add it to this group to save time. Now, practically speaking, if you have a hundred students in your class, you might want to you know, group at some point and then grade later, or you know, have one of your TAs group and have another one grade, or you can do it all in one go, it doesn't matter. But 
you can imagine the various divisions of labor there. Okay, so we're done with grouping, now we're gonna grade. So we are now group, grading an entire group with nine submissions, and basically grading all of your work at once. You all said 42, that's the correct answer. If you had all said something incorrect, I would have taken off points. Um, if you had said different things, I would have been uh, grading different groups, not just one group at this point. And going to the next answer, but there shouldn't be one. Yeah, we are done grading this question, so that's good. We're going to take a look at our grades. Looks like you all did spectacularly. Congratulations. We're now going to post these grades to Brightspace. So previously, when I set up the course, I linked it to Brightspace so that what is now happening is these grades are being sent from Gradescope back into uh, Brightspace, except that Lucy and Carrie are no longer on the Brightspace roster for some reason. I must have changed it at some point. And now that we're done, we're going to compose an email to the students. We're going to tell them that they all did splendidly. And you can customize this email. Um, okay, so now we are done grading the first assignment. Now let's hop over back to um, our Brightspace page. And let me just take a look at the chat. So, yeah, so Gradescope apparently also works together with Git. That's great. I'm learning from you guys as well. I appreciate that. And um, there's a question during the first phase when students uploaded their zip files. Can you choose to hide the autograded score from until you have a chance to release the grades? That may help with the guessing issue. Yes, you can. Um, so I have chosen to what's called publish the grades on, on Gradescope. Uh, publishing in this context means that as soon as a student uploads their assignment to Gradescope and waits for the uh, autograder to finish, they then get to see their score. And if and this is because this assignment is published. If I had un if I chose not to publish it, or uh, if I now choose to unpublish the assignment, forget how to do this, but uh, there's a way to unpublish the assignment, or you can just skip publishing it. And in that case, I think yes, it does get around the problem of students guessing. Um, so that may be worth looking into. Okay, let's go back to grade scope, uh, to Brightspace. Now, uh, previously I had set up the grade book so that we can now look at students' grades from within Brightspace. Um, or at least normally we should be able to see them. Mm. Not entirely clear why they were not submitted properly, but normally they would now populate this column here. Um, and so uh, at the end of the course, you would then be able to compute the grade within Brightspace uh, fairly automatically. Okay, so um, this is as far as it goes for the student view. Now, let me pause for questions and then I'm going to go through the instructor view. I'm going to uh, show you how to set up all of this so that uh, you can also uh, benefit from this. Okay, if there's no questions, what I'm going to do now, oh, uh, Joe is asking, you also work, use this workflow for exams or just assignments. Uh, personally, I uh, decided to just get rid of exams during COVID, which was also when I started using the setup. So I don't have experience using this for exams. Uh, I will say that to some extent, the, the difference between assignments and exams is just how you label things. Um, so you could see each of these assignments as a big take home exam, if you will. Uh, you could even imagine a setting where all students are forced to um, solve the assignment within one hour or two, and they may or may not even be forced to sit in the same room. And so you could simulate the experience of an exam in that way. Um, so 
besides this, I, yeah, I'm not sure if there's any more kind of dedicated support. Okay. All right, so let me now go over the instructor part of the experience. So what I've done here is Um, so I've done a few things behind the scenes and let me just recap them. First, I've requested um, not one, but two Jupyter Hub sites from the NYU um, HPC team. And you have to do this a few weeks in advance of your course. There's an intake form. Uh, and sometimes it takes them just a few days to set up your site, um, but do give them a few weeks so that they don't run into crunch time before the semester starts. Also give yourself a little bit of time to get used to everything. And so these sites unfortunately expire at the end of the semester, which also means that if you're watching this as a recording, the sites that I'm referring to may no longer be around, the, the links may be dead. Um, but for those of you who are watching this live today, um, I have set up two sites and one of them is already fully set up. This is the one that we have been using now as students. The other one is in a blank slate, and um, we're going to be using it to essentially reproduce the setup that's already there on the first site. And you should feel free to log on to these sites as instructors. And now, when I say follow along, for those steps that involve setup as an instructor, uh, following along may be a little bit difficult because normally there's only one instructor per site, so we may be uh, getting into each other's way. Um, but uh, what I'll suggest as a policy is each of you should feel welcome to use the, um, the blank slate site uh, to try your own configurations. And I'll tell you in a moment how to do this in a way that doesn't interfere too much with everybody else. And I would ask that uh, once you're done experimenting that you uh, undo your configurations. Again, kind of leave it back in the blank slate for the next person to try it out. So, um, here are the links to the two instructor sites. This is the first, the one that's already populated. And this is the second, this is in a blank slate. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna go to the site that's in a blank slate, and I'm gonna essentially do all of the steps that I previously did for the populated site, the one that uh, we've been using so far. So, now, what you should also know is that um, there is a third site which essentially gives you access to settings for all of your Jupyter, all of the Jupyter sites that you control. So before I go into the, um, into the instructor site itself, let me just open the settings panel. So I'm gonna do this in Safari in another browser because for some reason it doesn't work for me from within Firefox. So I have three classes. Uh, these are the two demo sites that we're using today. And this is a class that I'm teaching right now this summer. And so for each of these sites, essentially you can choose, first of all, who has access. And it's important that you give access to all of the students in your course. The way to do this is you extract all of the net IDs from um, an appropriate list like the Brightspace list. Um, can be done with a simple Unix command. Um, now you need to paste them before your course starts. And if some students join your course late, you need to remember to give them access in this way before they are then able to log on to the student site. So I've done this previously with every one of you who has registered for this workshop, which is why you see your net IDs here. Now, in addition, you have this open access feature here, which you can use in the beginning of your class just to give students access for uh, two or three days, even if they don't have their net ID in this list yet. Okay, so I've actually done this before this workshop. So those of you who have registered very late, very recently, uh, should still be able to follow along. Now, this is a list for students. This is a list for instructors. So here, normally, you will want to post only your TA's net IDs and not your students' net IDs. 
today, since I want all of you to be able to act both as students and as instructors, I just posted the same list in both of these cases. Um, but normally this list would be much shorter. Um, among the many other settings, the one that I'll mention is RAM. So by default, RAM is at something like 800. And I found that for most auto grader assignments, you will want to use at least 1500 of RAM. You don't want to give yourself too much RAM either because that costs them money. Um, there's a way to see for each of the assignments you're working on how much RAM you need. We're going to look at that in a second, but essentially it should be at least 1500. Um, also remember that uh, for each site that you control, there is a different setting site. So what I've just done, I've done for both, um, both uh, of the setting, both of the Jupyter Hub sites that I'm using in today's presentation. Okay. Now, because you're all instructors, you all also have access to these setting sites. So feel free to take a look around. But I would of course ask that you not change the settings, uh, just so you don't prevent anybody else from accessing these sites or you don't cost NYU more money than is appropriate. Okay, so for, so much for the settings site. Let me then go back to the instructor site and feel free to post your questions in the chat at any point. Okay, so from within uh, within Brightspace, you can access the instructor site for our blank slate demo site from the contents tab links to Jupyter Hub for instructors. And it's this link. And of course, this link is not one we would share with students. They will be useless for them anyway. So you need to sign in using your NYU Net ID. And so now is actually an appropriate time for me not for you, but for me to choose Turbo Mode. Why? Because I'm going to install AutoGrader and a bunch of other packages that it depends on. And installation of these things does require a little bit more RAM and requires Turbo Mode. Okay. Now, if you are following along and you are not um, interested in installing things, then please choose General. If you are following along and you would like to install things, um, I will say, if you're watching this live, please don't, because I don't know what happens if a lot of us install things at the same time. If you're watching this as a recording, please feel free to choose Turbo Mode. So for those watching live, you would choose General. I am now going to choose Turbo Mode. So our game plan at this point is first of all to install Autograder and second to create the kind of assignment that I have just demoed to you. Next, we're going to want to export the auto grader from within this assignment into Gradescope. So essentially, we're going to want to enable Gradescope to do the things for us that we've just seen it do uh, for us as students. OK, so this is Jupyter Hub, uh, the time that you first access it. What we're going to do now is we're going to open a terminal. And then for those of you um, who want to follow along, what we'll do now is we'll create a Kana environment. A Kana environment is essentially a way to create a roll-off section within the site within which we're going to install our, our own personal copy of our grader and anything else we might want to install. And once we have created this environment, we will then be able to give students access to this environment. That's not students will not something students will be aware of, but that's something that's crucial so that students can actually use autograder enabled Jupyter Hub notebooks. Okay, so we do have to use Conda environments. Now, how to do this, how to create Conda environments is something that I I believe I have. written up, yes, here in the uh, I don't know if I have actually written it up. So in any case, so what you do
Give me just a second here as I get set up. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do conda create minus minus name and then I'm going to type otter in because this is how I choose to call my environment and if you are following along um, again if you're doing it live don't do this if you're doing if you're following along as a recording you would do otter n and then uh, your last name okay and this way nobody will interfere with anybody else's environment or uh, let's say your net id maybe this is better because there are two people called smith okay so here we go okay normally this should create our environment Um, okay, yes, we're done. Okay, now that we've created our environment, it's still a blank environment and we're not within this environment. So we're going to go into this environment by doing conda activate and then the name of the environment. So for me, this would be RN. And you have to remember, either remember to do this whenever you log on to the instructor site or uh, you can put this into your, uh, your uh, RC file or whatever you use to automate this step whenever you log on. Okay, so now we are within the other end environment. And so now what we want to do is actually install autograder. Okay, and so autograder is installed via pip. Okay, so this is installing autograder. Um, some error that I didn't expect. Hopefully it's not a serious one. We are working within the instructor site, that's good. Okay, and so now if you are using any specialized packages, let's say uh, NumPy or SitePy or anything like that in your assignments, uh, then you would install them into the same environment using either the pip command or if it's available, the conda install command. So if you have a package that's available both on conda and on pip, then use conda, that's preferred, but in the case of autograder, it is not actually available on conda, at least wasn't the last time I checked. So for example, I teach a class on natural language processing, a package that I use in a lot of my assignments is called NLTK. So I'm going to install it, and I believe that it's available from within conda. If not, it's going to complain in just a second. Okay, so it, install, it is installing an LTK as well as a whole bunch of packages that an LTK depends on. And now, if, um, if at some later stage you are creating an assignment and you're struck by inspiration, you want to use a package you haven't installed yet, uh, then you would install it at that stage. So you don't have to know now all the things you might use in the future. The only important thing is you want to install it into this environment that you've created, in my case, other n, and in your case, other n unit ID. Okay, so now this looks like it's going to take a while. Now, once this is done, we will be able to create a Jupyter notebook that uses other um, uses the autograder environment. And the way to do this, basically, you're going to, um, so you're going to have a um, Jupyter notebook that you edit as an instructor. Um, it's going to be questions and answers interspersed. So it's going to contain both the code that you use um, 
to ask your students questions and the code that you use to tell other grader how to grade the students' questions for those that can be graded automatically. And the way this looks like is something you can actually see on the other site, on the site where we've already set everything up for you. So I'm gonna go to that site. It's the same as the same link as uh, the blank slate site, but with the one instead of the two. And you can also find this link from within uh, Brightspace. Okay, so it's it's this link here. Okay, so I'm going to go into this group chat folder. So um, now, if you are doing everything by yourself, you don't have any fellow instructors, any TAs, then group chat is not relevant for you. And you can create your assignments anywhere you like, as long as it's not within the shared folder, because then the students would see um, essentially the model solution. If you are working with others um, who have access to the same site as you, so I do this with the TAs for my course, you're going to use the group chat folder. And again, as I mentioned before, within the group chat folder, you're going to want to create a folder that has a difficult when possible to guess name, because students should not be able to guess this name, otherwise they get access to your model solutions. Okay, now within this group chat folder, you can now do, within this um, hidden folder, you can now do whatever you like. So what I found useful is for each of my assignments, I create a folder that has just that assignment in it, that assignment in it. So this folder here contains, first of all, a file which has the same name as the assignment that you recognize from earlier as students, but we're going to look into it in a second. It's going to have your model solution in it as well. Next, it also contains a dist folder. The dist folder, we're going to see in a moment. Once we have created, let's say we are about to create this file, once we have created it, we will then use autograder to compile it into a number of things that will all be contained in the disk folder, some of which will be going into the shared folder for students to see, some of which will, going, will go into Gradescope for its autograder to work. Okay. So at this point, let's say that we are uh, just starting up with autograder, we're going to create a new folder. Yeah, we are done here. So we're gonna go into group share, and we're going to create a new folder. Um, I'm just going to call it secret ASDF. It's not a very good secret folder, but whatever. And now I'm going to go into this folder. I'm going to create a folder for the first assignment. And then within this assignment, folder. Now I'm going to create a new assignment. So I'm going to go in here. And now I'm going to create a new um, Jupyter notebook. Um, and um, actually what I'm going to do is instead of doing that here, I'm just going to go back to the site where I've already done this and I'm going to open it. And so this looks like a mouthful. Um, this is rather complex, but what I've done here is I've gone through the auto graded documentation and I've extracted every single feature and knob that you might possibly want to, uh, to fiddle with and I've put them all into a big config file. You don't have to include all of this, um, but if you do, it's convenient because most of these are just the default settings. And if you wanna change these settings, you can then just find it and change it. Let's say you don't want to, you don't want this feature that's, that um, makes it easier for students not, have, not to have to remember to save things. Remember that feature is a little bit buggy you could turn it off if you wanted to. Okay, so now in practice, uh, if you're doing this rather than from, 
rather than starting from scratch, I recommend you access the assignment one file in the in this page and just copy it over and then start with that. Or alternatively, there's also something I call de default assignment, which is even simpler. But I think assignment one is a good place to start from. Okay, so now scrolling down a little bit, what you'll see is this. So this says, okay, this is where autograder should start a start compiling a question from. Each question needs to have a name. It needs to be either manual or not. If it's not manual, it's going to be auto graded and it needs to have a certain number of points. And then we're going to write the question prompt. And this needs to be exactly in this format with question one or whatever in, uh, or at least it should be, I forget what needs to be, which is just my own best practices, but let's just follow this. And then we have to say begin solution. And now this solution is obviously not going to be shown to the students. Instead, it's going to be shown to the TAs. So I don't think that I actually got to show this, but the TAs actually have a way to see the model solutions when they are grading. Um, and so our model solution is 42. We say end solution and end question. Okay. Now, um, next, we have an autograded question. So the same kind of metadata, except it, it says manual false instead of manual true. And then the solution this time is code. And this code has to end in a line that assigns a variable, that assigns a value to a variable and has the hash solution at the end. So this is how it tells our grader that this is where it should look for the solution. Now, when our grader sees this, it does two things. First, it's going to extract from this information that the solution is actually 42. Second, it's going to compile this into the student facing version of this notebook, which is going to replace this 42 by three dots. And it's going to uh, eliminate this part. Okay, next. I told you earlier that there are two kinds of tests. The public tests are those that the students can execute by themselves. The private tests are those that GradeScope executes on your behalf when you submit. So now here I have one test, which is simply the public test that we saw earlier. So any test that's not explicitly qualified as hidden is public. So this is a public test. It checks in this case whether the type of the solution is integer. Now, this block here, it says a few things. First, that this test is not actually hidden. So you don't want your public tests to be hidden. That would defeat the purpose. Uh, and then this is what I choose for the test to display to the students when they execute it. Um, there's a number of other features that like config items that you can include here. And these you can also leave out if you don't want to, if you are lazy or whatever. Um, and then of course, a big documentation you can study, but this should get you started. So this is the first public test. Now this next test is hidden. So this is how we tell other grader that it is a hidden test. We just say slap, um, hashtag hidden. And this is actually the answer. Okay. And then end tests end question, and we are done. Okay, so let's say that you have set all of this up. So this is, okay, this is almost everything that we need. But then, very importantly, we need to make sure that this Jupyter Notebook actually is linked to the Conda environment that we have created earlier, the other environment. And this is done by clicking on kernel, change kernel, and selecting this appropriate kernel. Okay, so I have done this before. Uh, this is an easy gotcha. It's an easy thing to miss. If you forget to do this, then your Jupyter Notebook will not run properly, uh, especially for the students, because the students don't by default activate this environment. So you may not notice this because you've activated the environment, but the students will. Okay. So now 
I forget actually if this is something you can do um, automatically. Um, yes, it seems that you can. Yes, good. So it used to be you needed to install IPY kernel for this, but um, the folks at HPC, I think, have worked behind the scenes to make this easier for us. So what I've just done is I've gone over to the blank slate and I've uh, created a new notebook um, by going on new and then selecting the appropriate environment. And if you do this, then you're going to be sure that uh, it has the right environment. Okay, and now what you would do is you would insert various cells, code cells, markdown cells, raw and deconvert cells, and so on. Uh, you have to set the appropriate type of cell for each of the things that we've done here, right? So for example, this is this and this, and all of these autograded specific cells are raw and deconvert cells. These text cells are all markdown cells. Um, you just need to, I kind of follow along with what I've done here or consult the automated documentation. And in this way, you will create a file just like this. Okay, so let's say that you are done. You have created this file. So you're going to save it. You're going to close it. And um, okay, so now I close it and I'm back to the blank slate. But let's say that we are in the, in the site I've already set up. So we have everything done here. So, oh, in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try something. I'm going to download this assignment to my hard drive from the site number one. Hop over to site number two. You don't really need this one. And try if I can just upload it from my, my hard drive. And Um, oh, it seems like it did not, it does not seem to be able to access the right environment. So maybe I do need to, maybe I spoke too fast. Maybe I do need to install IPI, IPY kernel here. Let's go into our environment and install like IPY kernel. And again, this is helping us make sure that we can link the notebook we have created with the appropriate environment, which we have previously created on Conda and which contains both Autograde itself and any additional packages like NLTK that you might want your students to have access to. Basically, any additional packages that you are relying on within your um, Autograde notebooks. Okay, so this might take a while. So let's go back to the first site. And so let's say that we have done this. We are ready to use Otter to compile our notebook, our, our Jupyter notebook, into the various files that we will need. So the way we do this is via a tool called Otter Assign. So as always, let's make sure we are in our environment. Okay, and let's go to the place where we are working. Okay, and so now I have previously uh, run this command and it has previously created a folder I have chosen to call dist. Now I'm going to run this command again, and this time I'm gonna use a uh, different name for the folder so you, you can see it being created. So the command is otter assign v one assignment 01 or whatever is the name of your notebook, and then the name of the output folder. Okay, and v1 minus minus v1 has to do with the uh, 
uh, internal version of other grader. So uh, depending on which uh, kind of flavor of annotation you use, uh, your mileage may vary there. But if you're following along very exactly, then this is the appropriate flag to set. Okay, so everything worked correctly. Everything looked good. Um, so now there is a new folder created very freshly called this two. And so we're going to go into this folder, this two. And now within this folder, we see that seconds ago, two folders have been created. The student folder contains the version of the assignment that you're going to now put into the shared folder for your students to see. So this looks exactly like what I demoed half an hour ago. The other folder is called autograder and it contains a number of things. So first it contains a PDF template, which has, the, which has each question that uh, is manually gradable together with the model solution. In this case, there's just one such question. Next, it contains, well, I don't actually know much about this file, so let's ignore it. It contains a model solution of your Jupyter assignment. So make sure you don't share this with the students, obviously. So this model solution now, you can run it. And you should always run it. You'll always want to run it before you deploy it, just to make sure that everything actually checks out. So we're going to download this zip file to our hard drive, and later on, we're going to use it to test our autograder. OK. Now, next is this file here. It has autograder in its name. So this is something that we will want to download to our hard drive and then go over to Gradescope and upload it there. So by the way, one more thing you can see here is the zip file that we've just created by running the model solution. That's where it lives, okay. So now let's go over to Gradescope. Um, so let's say that we are configuring Gradescope for the first time. So we're gonna go into it. And now I've already done this before, before this demo. Uh, so I've already set up a number of assignments. So I'm not gonna go through the exact steps of how to create an assignment from scratch. Instead, I'm just gonna show you these assignments. So what I found useful, so first of all, remember that there's going to be two assignments to create, one for the manual graded questions and one for the auto graded questions. So what I found useful is to use this naming scheme. So it's very, very clear to students. Don't submit here, submit here. Okay, now let's start with the auto graded assignment. Once you create it, you're going to configure the auto grader, which means you're going to upload the file that you just downloaded from Jupyter Hub. In this case, I've done it before. So instead of uploading it, it says replace. So I can replace it and update it. And now it's going to compile it internally, which, which is going to take like five to 10 minutes. And once that is done, I'll be able to test it. And I really recommend that you do that before you deploy your assignment. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and click test. And because this is still going on for a while, what this is gonna do is it's going to test the previous version, which in this case is identical to the current version, but just so you know what it looks like. So what we're gonna do here to test it is we're gonna take, we're gonna go back to that model solution that we created. So remember when we ran the model solution, it created a zip file for us. So we can download the zip file from Jupyter Hub to our hard drive. And then we're gonna test the auto grader by uploading it from our hard drive. And now if everything has been set up properly, then in a minute or two, it should give us a success message. 
And at that point, at that point, we know that the oil grader has been set up properly. Now, a few other things that you will want to do before you release the assignment. So um, you will want to, first of all, you will want to log on to your um, grade scope site as a student. So basically, you'll want to create a non NYU email address account and then go to the grade scope roster for your course and add that account manually, like I did here with my Gmail address. And then from that account, you will want to uh, log on to GradeScope and upload the model solution. Um, and if you want to be extra safe, you'll of course want to manually work through the assignment or ask your TA to do that and upload the solution that had been created organically in that way. Uh, now going back to the instructor. So on GradeScope, the instructor, you as the instructor will want to go into each of the assignments. And then you will want to think about whether you want to publish the grades. And this goes back to what somebody was asking earlier. If you choose to publish the grades, then that means that anyone who submits from that point on will be able to see the result of their auto grader in just a few moments after they've submitted it. If you choose not to, if you leave them as is, they're unpublished, and that means students will not see those results until you publish your grades, which you can choose to do after the due date. Okay, so you will want to do this, and then a few other things. So remember that we have two, um, two parts to the assignments, a manually graded and an automatically graded part. And so this requires a little bit of setup. So this is how to do it. Within the assignment that you've created, and so now you want to make sure you're working on the assignment, master assignment, essentially, the one with all of these conflicts. What you need to do is the following. First, you need to find the course ID of your grade school course. That's this one. Second, for each assignment, you want to find the assignment ID, ID of the manually graded assignment. This is very important. Make sure you look for the assignment ID of the manually graded assignment, not the auto graded assignment. So it's this one. So yeah, I'm assuming that you've gone in and you've created a manually graded assignment. You just call it manually graded and so on. So this will give you this part of the URL, that's the assignment ID. This is the course ID, this is the assignment ID. Now, you go back into your config and then you put your, the assignment ID of the manually graded assignment right here. This is crucial because this and this alone will give the auto grader on grade scope the ability to submit, to ship out the manually graded part of the assignment from within itself into the manually graded assignment on grade scope that you previously set up. If you don't do this, then anyone who submits will not see the manual graded part of the assignment appear on the grade scope where it should. Okay, so this is critical. Okay, now, by the way, another thing to mention is by default, Every time that you run under assign, this command line tool I used earlier to create all of those files, it's going to ask you for your grade scope password, and that's okay. But you might have noticed that, um, or you won't have noticed it, but it didn't ask me this. The reason it didn't ask me this is I extracted something called a grade scope token from the grade scope site and inserted it into this assignment here. The grade scope token is essentially like a password. It allows Jupyter Hub to interact with grade scope without asking me for my password every single time. Now, this token is specific to your grade scope um, account. And what I'm going to do um, after this uh, course ends is I'm going to go, I'm going to destroy this token uh, so that nobody watches this account and uh, this, uh, this video. Um, 
end up being able to access my grade school site. I don't expect that will be a problem, but you never know where this video will end up being posted. Okay, but I mentioned this because if you if you really like um, if you do this um, stuff that I'm teaching today, it will be necessary for you to run under a sign 100 times or so in the course of the semester. It gets really tedious to have to type in your password every single time. So this is why I recommend using the token. Okay, so with this set up properly, you will then be able to go into the manually graded part. And then what you want to do is this. Within the edit outline part, you will want to upload this PDF that I just showed you, the one that has been created by auto assigned within the auto grader folder and that contains the model solution for each manually graded question. And within this PDF, you will then want to create a like a rectangle which essentially says to grade scope, okay, here is the area that contains the answer to this question. I've already done this here, centered around the solution part of the model solution. You want to make sure that it has enough space in case some students might want to write an essay, but not too much, so that the OCR works well in case students do tend to give the same answers. You'll also want to give this the name of the question. Don't give it a name that gives away the answer because the students will get to see this. Give it the same number of points that you've chosen on Autograder on auto and make sure to click save after you're done. Okay. Now, next, um, you may want to create a rubric. Um, this essentially makes uh, the TA's job easier. Now, by the time that your submissions come in, so this is jumping ahead when you deploy this, you'll be able to see them here. And some of the things that may happen, students may submit to the wrong place. And in that case, you can manage this from here. You can erase those submissions or move them to another slot or whatever you need to do. Um, once you're done with all of this, you'll be able to grade them as I've showed earlier. You'll be able to review the grades and publish them and post them to Brightspace and so on. Um, regrade requests are also a nice feature of Gradescope. If a student is not happy with the grade that they got, they can submit a regrade request and the TA can review it. Um, can also give students individual extensions. Um, uh, so in general, the, ex the, the assignment due dates will be managed entirely from within Grade scope. Jupyter Notebook does not support anything like assignment due dates. So you will want to go and uh, go into the settings for each assignment and make sure that the due dates are whatever you want them to be. So, for example, um, yeah, both the release date and the due dates, and if you choose to give one the late due dates. And what you want to make sure is that. Um, the release date for the manually graded assignment is at least as early as for the auto graded assignment, because otherwise the auto graded assignment won't see the manually graded assignment and won't be able to submit on your behalf. For the auto graded assignment, you'll also want to set the CPU. Uh, well, in some cases, you may want to set the CPU to a little bit more RAM uh, in case you find that it doesn't grade properly. But by default, half the CPU should do the trick for as simple an assignment as the one you're considering right now. Um, okay, so there's probably a number of other things. Oh yes, so you wanna uh, you wanna also create a version of your assignment on Brightspace, and then once you've done this, you can link your grade scope assignment to that assignment. Um, this then allows you to push the grades from grade scope back to Brightspace, which in turn allows you to compute the grade, first of all, to make them visible to students as we're used to, and second, also to compute them at the end of the semester. And since this turns out to be a little bit non-trivial, let me go over this too. Um, so within Brightspace, each of the assignments will have two parts, just like each of the grade scope, each of the Jupyter Hub assignments has two parts on grade scope. So within the grades tool, 
you'll want to set up an assignment called, for example, assignment one auto graded part, and another one called assignment one manual part. And then once you've set them up, uh, you can link them from within Gradescope like I did. And then ideally the grades will appear here, even though for some reason today they're not appearing there as they should. Okay, once you've set these up, you will want to combine them. So to combine them, what I ended up finding the most useful, maybe it's the only way, maybe there's another way, is to also create a, a separate assignment item corresponding to each of the two-part assignments. So somebody is, created, is asking, are those created as grades in Brightspace or full-on assignments? So from within Brightspace, each of these things is, I think it's called an item. So this is an item, this is an item, and this is an item. And let me just jump into this item here. So this item is what students will see. I don't actually show them either of this and this, although I suppose I could, but it might confuse them. And so what I've done here, oh wait, did I actually do this? Um, Somebody asking, is this using the assignments? Oh, yes, thank you. So that's an important point. So we are not using the assignments tool from uh, the nav bar. We are using the grades tool only. I think the assignments tool is empty. Yeah, so we're just not using this at all. Okay, so, so from within the grades tool, grades tool, excuse me. So we're going to go into that assignment that I just had. And then what it should do is, um, so actually what I wanted to do, uh, what I wanted to do is have a formula. I actually forget how to do this right now. I'm a little bit confused here. Um, perhaps Lucy or somebody else can remind me how to create a formula, but essentially the idea is to use a formula tool from within Brightspace to say that this assignment is worth the sum of what this is, sorry, this um, item is worth the sum of what this is worth and what this is worth. And now in this specific case, I have chosen to assign 50 points to each of the two questions. But in general, there's no reason that, no reason to expect that your, your manual questions and your auto graded questions will always be weighted equally. Uh, many of my assignments are not weighted equally in this way, and that's why it's good to be able to use uh, formula grades, um, the, the formula tool uh, in this way. And Lucy is saying that Andrew Green may be able to help. So Andrew did help me a lot with this. Thanks, Andrew. And so, uh, so this is what we would want to, to do here. Yeah, I'm not sure why uh, it's not showing up here. Um, but um, essentially that's what we do and then Everything else from then on, oh, one more thing to mention. So for some reason, when you want to combine different formula-based assignments from within Brightspace to an overall grade within Brightspace, uh, sorry, formula-based items, for some reason, I found that I have to use a formula to compute the overall grade as well. In fact, I... I suspect it may be bad in Brightspace, but for, for whatever reason, this is what I found to be necessary. And so if we go to grades, I think I can show you what I did for this one. The final calculated grade. Oh, wait, I, uh, I did not do this. Um, but so, so what you can do and what you will probably have to do is set up a formula here that combines all of the assignments or all of the you know, parts of assignments in the appropriate way for the entire course. So it's a little bit annoying. You can't, you can't rely on the kind of more basic parts of the grade book in, or the, you know, the grade tool in, um, in Bytespace, but uh, it did work for me. So I actually did get it to work for two of my actual life courses. Oh yeah, maybe the setup wizard. Uh, thanks, Manfred. So, you may have to access the setup wizard 
to tell it that you want to use a formula. So this thing here. Okay. So I think this is essentially it. Of course, we could delve much more deeply into various aspects of our grader. Um, another thing I didn't get to is to actually show you a real life assignment and not just kind of this basic assignment um, uh, in the way that I use it in my own classes. I'm happy to stay on the call for a little bit longer if people are interested to see this or if, they, if you have any questions. Um, but at this point, I think this should get you started. I'll just mention, so the whole thing is kind of time intensive at the outset. And this time, essentially, you recoup it or those who do the grading, um, whether that's you or the TAs, recoup it in the long run, especially if you have either a lot of assignments or if you uh, teach your course multiple times. And the last thing I'll say is that the, the course that I'm teaching that's using these assignments, it's actually um, so the students really like these assignments. They, they find it very, very helpful. They say that they learn a lot. Um, maybe I should have led with this because at the end of the day, we don't care about technology so much as learning outcomes. But the students really report that these interactive assignments, they really, really help them. Um, so that's it for me from me at this point. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you again, uh, Lucy and your team and Carrie, um, who have helped me a lot setting up um, both this workshop and also the, uh, the courses that I'm using this setup for. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I'm happy to stay on if anyone would like to see more or ask questions. Lucas, thank you so much for this. Um, I know I've learned quite a bit in an hour and a half. Um, and as Lucas said, he's happy to stay on um, and answer any questions. And hopefully, maybe we'll need a follow-up um, webinar one of these days as well uh, to keep building on this. So thank you all for being here. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week if you need to head off. And if you have questions, please stick around. Thank you so much, Lucas. Can I use the microphone to ask questions? Sure. Yes. Okay. Um,